is simply very appropriate. And um, as a participant now, I'm looking forward to you know our conversation. And Mark, I'll turn it over to you as moderator. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor von Schirach. And I'd like to do a shout out to Paolo for really putting together not only these series of webinars and to build up GPI's mm -hmm. level of, uh, of analysis, which is on a very high level on all these issues, uh, but also uh, you know, his participation in BAU and also in GPI to bring this, these entities forward in their, uh, in their mission. So <laughs> thank you very much, Paolo. I'd also like to do a quick shout out to Denis Karatash, who's the executive director of GPI, who is behind the scenes putting these things together, which is not that simple to do, although it looks very simple <laughs> because we're, all we're doing today is Zooming, everybody's Zooming, but it's a lot of work. So Denise, thank you very, very much. Um, obviously, this subject is one of extraordinary interest and uh, you know, the, the, the news moves apace, the international developments are at lightning speed. And today we have the privilege of having with us, in addition to Professor von Schirach, uh, two distinguished experts in international relations. Uh, and I'd just like to introduce them uh, very quickly. Their, their full bios are in the event materials. Uh, first of all, Luis Tomé. Dr. Luis Tomé is the Associate Professor at the Autonoma University of Lisbon, or Lisboa, as Paolo pointed out. And I had the privilege of meeting him in Lisbon uh, when I presented a paper on Turkish politics last year, and it's a wonderful institution. And Luis is, is a very, very, and you'll see, very knowledgeable expert in international affairs. And also, Dr. Robert Sutter, professor of international affairs at George Washington University. Um, it, among other things, he's written 22 books. I think that says a lot. But in other words, he's an expert, particularly on international relations and on China, and we'll, we'll get to all of those subjects as we get, go along in the, in the webinar. The first thing I wanted to touch on, and I'm going to throw it out to the panel, is the extraordinary debate, or say discussion among the pundits on where are we in global politics today, right? So just as an example, par example, uh, you have uh, Henry Kissinger saying that the coronavirus pandemic will forever alter the world order. Then you have Professor Joseph Nye of Harvard University who says no. The coronavirus will not change the global order. And then Richard Haas of the Council on Foreign Relations is among many, many commentators. The pandemic will accelerate history rather than reshape it. So we're just going along in the same direction. And he kind of argues that American leadership is waning and so forth. So I want to throw it out to the panel now. And please tell me which of these or any option there to or any uh, permutation what do you think is happening to the world global order and to global politics? I'll start with Paolo, and then we'll go on to the other panelists. Paolo, please. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, look, uh, I don't know. Maybe this is uh, belaboring on the obvious. Uh, the one thing, the one major casualty, but it wasn't really brought about by coronavirus. It, this was in the making before, is uh, uh, the uh, sort of a widespread skepticism uh, about China. Uh, not, you know, we've heard the whole, all the stories, all the theories, we're not going to belabor on them and what the Chinese have done or haven't done, the lack of transparency in, uh, in uh, providing timely information about uh, the outbreak in Wuhan and this, I mean, there's a long story there, but I think whatever actually has happened and what we may or may not have exactly ascertained as facts as opposed to theories, uh, the reality is uh, that the world has discovered, for whatever reasons, that it doesn't really like China very much. That is, a, in, a, in an odd way, uh, whether you like this development or not, a credit to President Trump. Say, so what's that got to do with anything? Well, President Trump, as you know, started the trade war with China, which obviously is completely unrelated to the coronavirus, which happened you know, this year. But clearly, it, it managed to gel um, an anti-Chinese feeling, at least here in the United States, which was a kind of subterraneous, not really fully expressed, but it turns out it's pretty intense and quite bipartisan. Uh, leading members of the Democratic Party, I'm not sure about Mr. Biden, I don't know if he's said anything in this regard, but I'm thinking about Senator Warner of Virginia, who is the ranking member in the Senate Intelligence Committee, an extremely strong voice, uh, you know, uh, pointing out the perils of, uh, represented by China, about intellectual property theft, about our dependence on, 
on, on supply chains, about Huawei, about the whole list. Now, with this business of, uh, of coronavirus and the perceived, uh, you know, sort of stealthy, um, you know, opaque way or, or, or manipulative way in which China has handled it, simply has reinforced this. So I think that we can expect that as a change. There is a, today, you know, um, in the Wall Street Journal, there is a long, uh, interesting uh, op-ed piece uh, about the University of Queensland, of all places, in Australia, indicating how the Chinese has essentially colonized, you know, this uh, distinguished uh, academic institution in Australia, sort of buying their way in. And again, this is exposed, it's an expose, if you wish. I'm not sure what consequences this will have, but saying, hey, we've got to watch out. The Chinese are, you know, not playing by the rules, et cetera, et cetera. Last but not least, I could mention the profound dissatisfaction expressed in many parts of, the, of emerging countries, in particular Africa, where I've worked for more than 25 years, in which the Chinese uh, are there very strongly and considered by public opinion as worse than the colonizers. Okay, the British were better, they say. The British, you know, mm. at least they, they were more humane. The Chinese are exploiters and they're just here, they destroy everything mm. and all that. Again, I don't want to maybe overstate the point, but I would say that it is not, um, that it is not improbable that there will be an effort, whoever will win the elections here in the United States in November, to strengthen ties among Western countries. I'm thinking about, you know, the old trilateral, is, you know, members, Europe, North America, Japan, to begin with, to create a counterbalance to China. How that, how, how, if that is actually feasible and how that is going to be articulated, I have no idea. But I don't think that it is possible to go back to sort of a amicable, friendly, you know, maybe not particularly warm, but, you know, uh, relations with China on the hope that China is uh, maybe in the middle of the river, but it's kind of becoming more like us. No, I don't the consensus is they're not like us, whether they're just competitors or worse, you know, the jury's out. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'd like to turn to Luis Tomei, Professor Tomei, your thoughts on this subject, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, Mr. Chairman. Answering your question, where are we in global politics? I would say my first argument is this COVID-19 became a new opportunity for China, mainly because of the Trump administration and European mistakes. However, at the same time, for some countries and political leaders, this crisis also tends, in my view, to change somewhat the perspective about China, uh, a benignant giant from whose growth everyone can benefit, for the various challenges that resurgent China also represents. In other words, this crisis may help to affirm China as a superpower, but the, it may also bring the costs inherent in that condition. On the other hand, I think this crisis generated by COVID-19 pandemic will not substantially alter the international order or the hierarchy of powers or the pattern of interaction between the great powers. But it will highlight some previous trends and or act as an accelerator of existing geopolitical trends. And I give you just the main of these trends. China rise as a superpower, growing bipolarity between the resurgent China and the prominent US in a power structure that is also Multi, multipolar, the shift in the economic and strategic balance of power from west to east, a pattern of interaction between major players that misses elements of competition and cooperation, that the word is engagement, containment and engagement, engagement at the same time, the US lack of ability and inability to lead the global response to address global problems and global solutions, the lack of cohesion and solidarity in response to the pandemic among NATO members and EU member states, 
and uh, also the expansion and instrumentalization of nationalism in its various forms and manifestations, not only in the autocratic regimes from China to Iran or Russia, but also up to a certain point in the US and uh, in Europe. So this is my main argument to start. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to turn it now to mm. Professor Sutter. Bob? Well, first, I want to thank uh, everyone for inviting me and, uh, and being part of this group. <clears throat> I really do uh, think this is a very important subject. And uh, I don't know a lot about a lot of things. But I do know a lot about US-China relations. And so I'm a little myopic about this. And so I can share my insights on that. But in the broader context of things, I, this is what I see. Power centers of the world, the big power centers, are generally uh, declining. Uh, the West, uh, uh, Europe is declining in strength, Japan certainly, the United States arguably, uh, and China has been rising, and Russia has been declining. But China has been rising. And, uh, and this, uh, so China really looks strong compared to these other power sources. It is strong, uh, but it looks stronger than it would be otherwise. Uh, the virus has weakened us all. Uh, for the time being, I think we're all going to be preoccupied with the virus. And uh, uh, the Chinese are coming out of it, but it's not going to be that quick for them. And it's certainly not going to be quick for the rest of us. So I think this, this rise of China and how you deal with it is, uh, is a fundamental issue. And I guess the issue, I'm, the way I'm looking at it, the framework I'm looking is great power uh, competition, great power politics. Uh, we have, this doesn't, what's happened with the virus doesn't get us to a different place as far as great power politics are concerned. These remain fundamental. And I think the first speaker underlined the vision from the, the view from the United States, uh, this, this negativism toward China. And this is quite, uh, and he, he referred, uh, I think, rightfully to Senator Warner, who captures a big part of this, uh, this negativism, which I think is important to understand. But what I'd like to just address those a little bit is what's at stake. Uh, and Mr. Warner will articulate this very well. And this has been widely, this has been seen on Capitol Hill and, and it's been seen in the administration, but not very well in, by the public. The public doesn't like China and the, and the virus has reinforced that. Uh, the rest of the world, by the way, doesn't necessarily dislike China. It's a, it's a, but the United States is definitely in this, in this situation. And what's at stake here from Mr. Warner, uh, and he's on the Senate Intelligence Committee. He's been there for five, six years. Uh, so he knows a lot about what's going on, and, his, and he made his money in high tech. He says, we're in a competition with China for the new industries of the world, high tech industries. And we are. And who wins this race will be the dominant economic power in the future. And ladies and gentlemen, who wins this race will have the dominant technology to be the dominant military. You tend to look at these kinds of great power competitions and you look at the militaries. And China's military is smaller than the American and not as advanced in many ways. But that isn't really the story. The story is this high tech, tech uh, competition. And so this will resume, it's underway now, and it will resume more strongly after we deal with the virus. So we're slowing down, but we have this acute competition because if China does win this race, they will be the leading economic power in the high technology area and they will be the leading military power. This will mean that the United States will be secondary. People like Mr. Warner don't want that to happen. So this is a very serious matter. So uh, I want to, uh, this is something that I'm focusing on. I think this is a fundamental trend that we need to keep track of. Uh, it's been interrupted by the virus. Uh, the situation politically in the United States is now more supportive of being very skeptical toward China as a result of the virus. And so I think this is going to continue, but it isn't just a matter of liking and disliking. It's a matter of dominance. And that's what I think needs to be addressed. Thank you. Uh, Mark, with your with your yes, indulgence, if I course. if I could just add a footnote to, I appreciate very much what Professor Sutter just said. I just wanted to add, um, um, you know, a little news item that maybe you, as you follow these matters uh, closely, 
you, you're very familiar with, that there is a, an initiative as I, that I have read um, about uh, um, in the future uh, budget, the budget that is being uh, looked at for next fiscal year, to give uh, a substantial amount of money to the Pentagon to support uh, the production or importation of rare earth minerals. That's right. Uh, that are, as you correctly pointed out, are sort of the precursors, if you wish, of many of these new technologies. You need this kind of stuff. And we don't have almost any of it domestically. We, we used to have some, but not that much. Uh, and guess what? We import most of them from China. And so there is this concern about not being dependent on China and to create alternative sourcing uh, opportunities. And again, this would be a kind of a first because the Pentagon usually doesn't go buy stuff you know, around the world, uh, doesn't buy commodities. And this amount of money, by the way, it's not spectacular, but it is uh, almost unprecedented in, as a move. And so I think it simply, you know, supports uh, what Professor Sutter just uh, articulated. And yes, it is, a, it is a, a race for dominance, but also it is a race for dominance, I would stress, with a competitor who we believe, and again, the, ch the charges may be exaggerated, doesn't play by the rules. So it's one thing is to be a competitor. Another thing is to have a competitor that is accused of doing all sorts of underhanded things in terms of uh, stealing intellectual, intellectual property, forced uh, technology transfer for American companies. You know the list. I mean, it's very well, it's been articulated many times. Now, this may be an exaggeration, but the sense is that not only we have a problem of a competitor, which, uh, you know, fair enough, it's a free world, it's a, you know, if, uh, and everybody's free to, to do what their best and, and, and let the best win. But if the perception is that our competitor is not playing by the rules, that becomes a more complicated story. Thank you. Well, that was, uh, that was a, a, a great opening discussion with uh, many different issues. Um, I'd like to be speaking of underhanded and all those sorts of things. I just like to immediately jump into the WHO just to get that out of the way because that's really important. Also because China is now engaged in a charm offensive. Uh, the United States is threatening to pull out of the WHO and, and uh, Xi Jinping says, I'm giving $2 billion to the coronavirus. So yes, the United States can pull out and have no influence, but China is going to be uh, a top player. And also what we're seeing are these tweets and Twitter attacks on Pompeo these little cartoons about Parpeo and the rhetoric from Trump is very, very sharp. I also heard today that um, there's bipartisan legislation, the purpose of which is to provide oversight on Chinese companies that operate in the United States by forcing them to provide their accounting documents, uh, which the question has been whether those are fully disclosive and they're fully open and transparent. Uh, we see these developments in Capitol Hill, as Professor Sutter indicated, where we're ramping up the tension between the two countries. Just want to mention one thing and then get your reaction on WHO. Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia, has a piece in uh, Foreign Affairs. And he, he believes that the pandemic bodes ill for both American and Chinese power and for the global order. He's worried about the Cold War uh, imminently. He says, maybe not a Cold War 2.0, he says, but maybe it's going to be a Cold War 1.5. So, um, and there is a certain connection that he talks about between the United States and China. Do you think with these developments and China having its meetings now, the two sessions, and I'd like to throw out there, there's a lot to throw out there, Taiwan, which seems to now be coming more and more discussed, which I mean, if those of us that remember the Taiwan issue years ago, that was a very big issue for Americans and chi about China and protecting Taiwan. This is coming back. Are we seeing the fabric of this relationship being ripped apart? Um, or is it going to be more engagement of what Professor Tomei is saying? It'll be competition, but engagement at the same time. Or with these kind of um, uh, attacks back and forth and the rhetoric, are we at a point where this is going to be ripped apart? So, uh, Luis, you want to handle that and uh, uh, see what you think? Yeah, 
first of all, I'd like to say something on this idea that this China is not playing by the rules. It is correct, it is true, but at the same time, from an European perspective, and not only European, I think Trump's administration, in fact, is the grand disturbance of the international order in the last few years. Mm -hmm. I give you some examples. One of the rules of the international relations is to keep um, faith in the, in the compromise. Uh, the Trump administration took out the US from the TPP, from UNESCO, from the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, from Global Compact on Migration and Refugees, from the five plus one deal with Iran, nuclear uh, Iran, and so on. So in many issues of the global agenda, uh, most of the US European allies and Asia Pacific allies are in the same side of China and on the opposite side of the US, including in concerning some multilateralism and international institutions. There is no doubt that China is also increasing its influence in international institutions. I think China is playing on both sides. At one hand, the so-called embedded revisionism from within international institutions, changing the rules on its own interest. And with the positions coming from Trump's administration gives more room for China's rising influence, both in UN agencies or World Trade Organization and so on. At the same time, China is recreating new institutions, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, for instance, or this Belt and Road Initiative. So my question is, we need to understand, in my point of view, that this new bipolar order is not the return for, to the former Cold War. And we cannot use the same mental framework and strategies and policies. It's not possible only containment these days to address China because the international system is completely different and China is not the USSR. China is the biggest trade partner of the US and uh, the US is the biggest trade partner of China. Uh, it is impossible to address major global affair without involving China and US. Of course, in the future, we could have mainly competition, but if that happens, we all gonna lose. And I think we need a renewed US leadership. We, the European, are waiting more leadership uh, from the US in the global affairs, including to address China properly and to lead also the international institutions that support the liberal international order. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, more rules are being recreated by China against our democratic values, our liberal values. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to address China in a very pragmatic way using the same strategy that China is using. Sometimes with, with competition, we're joining efforts to promote rules that China should respect, uh, both in economic, trade, property rights, human rights, and so on. And on the other hand, keep faith in our values, uh, not changing the order that we create. This is only my my point of view. Thank you. It's a, it's a very um, a hopeful point of view. Uh, before I call on Bob to comment, I just wanted to mention that if you want to ask a question, I think you can go on your chat, uh, on your screen on the bottom. There's something that says chat. Uh, I don't know if it says Q&A or chat, but you click on that and put a question in. We welcome your questions. Um, so please ask questions. Uh, let me turn it over to Bob. Bob, what, what do you think? Well, I think Lewis's idea is a very good one. Um, 
I just think we're not in that situation right now. Um, but I, uh, the Trump government is, uh, it's not, it has a, if you look at their stated strategy, it's a very good document. It's coherent. Uh, but the practice uh, is, uh, uh, we have a very unpredictable president, and he keeps uh, doing things that undercut the strategy. Uh, and some of the things that uh, Luis was talking to, and how he's been dealing with the allies in Europe and the allies in Asia <clears throat> is very negative. If, if you're going to have a strategy to deal with China, you're going to need allies. And, uh, and, and he, uh, he wants the allies to do all sorts of things uh, that uh, they don't want to do, and it makes it very difficult uh, to follow through with an effective approach. So, uh, so America is not in a good position uh, right now uh, uh, to uh, deal with China. And so what you find mm -hmm. that the, what they're doing is uh, deconstructing the relationship. Obviously, the Americans found that the relationship with China has not worked for them. It's had very negative re repercussions for the United States. And so they're destroying that relationship. They're uh, dismembering it. And, uh, and the virus is adding to that dismemberment. Uh, so this is, uh, this is continuing the process. Uh, what are they building uh, in order to deal with the new situation, to make the world better, to do the things that Luis was talking about? Well, they have plans, uh, but uh, they don't really, they're, they're not following through with them very well uh, 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 because uh, of many reasons, but in particular because of the leadership of the United States. Uh, this is an extraordinary situation where, where, uh, where we need uh, strong, focused leadership. And, uh, and we don't have it. And so uh, uh, the benefit of, of, uh, of, of Mr. Trump that uh, Luis didn't mention was that if we have this order that we had before dealing with China, they subverted it. And they were able to do that because nobody would hold them to account. No leader would stand up to the Chinese and say, you do that, we're going to do this. Uh, well, now Mr. Trump does that. And so that's to his credit. Uh, but unfortunately, he does it in a very erratic way. So, uh, so we're in a very tough position right now. And, uh, uh, and so I, I, as an American, I, I worry about the situation. Uh, and I, I hope we come out of it uh, uh, with a greater sense of unity with our allies and a unity within our country. Uh, that's, that's probably the main thing that's needed right now. Will Americans come together? Not against China, just come together and have a coherent sense of where they want to go in the world. I certainly hope so, but, I, uh, but unfortunately, we're, we remain very divided, and this election campaign is going to focus on division. It's not going to focus on bringing us together. And that's really a tragedy, in a way, because we need to do that. Thank you, Bob. Um, it reminds me of um, uh, a diplomat I knew who once said that prognosticating in international affairs and domestic affairs is making a, like astrology be a perfect science. So we really don't know how it's going to turn out. But I would say when you talk about Trump's er erratic politics and his, the Trump doctrine, which has been, as Luis indicated, pulling out of all these multilateral agreements, um, our friend Tip O'Neill once said, all politics is local. And in fact, we have an election coming here. And Trump's politics is oriented to winning the election. And everything he does is about winning the election. He has seized upon the China issue now as a hot issue to press on that his base likes. And he's going to keep pressing it. My question, and to prognosticate, and it kind of raises the Graham Allison, the Thucydides trap, you know, the rising China that Bob Sutter talked about. Well, how do we deal with this? Especially if Trump is reelected and he becomes president again, so you still have that erratic leadership. How do we fix it? Do we have a, a Trump doctrine 2.0, which is kind of nationalism, but we also reach out to our allies to try to counter China? Do you have any thoughts on how we structure this going forward, Paolo? Well, uh, <clears throat> look, first, let me just go back to the previous question when you're talking about, you asking about the WHO. Yes, so the yes. WHO is a perfect illustration of, um, of the Chinese uh, uh, game plan. Um, the China um, fostered and promoted the, the, uh, the former Ethiopian Minister of Foreign Affairs <clears throat> as the head of the WHO. And you wonder why. 
Well, go to, go to Ethiopia, uh, where I have been, and I worked for a few years. The <clears throat> um, Djibouti Addis Ababa railway, built by China, the new mm. airport, built by China, the mm. Grand Renaissance dam turbines, provided and financed by China, the, the metro, you know, the elevated rail in Addis Ababa, built by China. Shall I go on? Okay. Mm. So it, the country is owned by China. I don't want to exaggerate. Please allow me some hyperbole. You know, mm -hmm. it, there is a, a, a tremendous debt to China. And so when their man is put there, he will do what China tells them to do. And this is exactly what he did at the beginning of the coronavirus. He went to China and said, oh my God, this is brilliant. This is the best response that we could ever, this, we congratulate China on this foresight and leadership and all that. I suspect that wasn't entirely genuine. I would call that a command performance of somebody mm -hmm. who knows who put him there. All right. So that's an example of China's ability to their credit to use international institutions in a way that over time favors their, their interests. So that's just one example. But to your point, uh, Mark, about the, obviously President Trump uh, trying to change the conversation, let's not you know, hide the reality. The, domestic uh, response to coronavirus has been a disaster. We had nothing. We had no plan. We had no contingencies. We had no stockpiles of anything. We had no early warning system. This is really a national disaster as far as I, and I'm not an epidemiologist, but I'm looking at talking about the neighborhood of China. Look at Taiwan, 440 you know, cases, and I don't know, a couple of dozen, I don't know, a dozen people dead. Why? Because they had a plan and they enacted it. They worked on it. And how did they have a plan? Because they were scarred by the 2003 SARS pandemic, which also came from China. And they said, never again. So that tells you that it is possible, even without a vaccine and without a, you know, a real cure, to do better. That's parenthetically. However, as Mark pointed out, right now, for Mr. Trump, it is quite expedient to say, this is not my fault. I did the best I could because I'm the greatest president. And guess what? It's all China's fault. And so that adds you know, gasoline to the fire. And uh, therefore, I see very little chance that in kind of the, as the rhetoric will be inflamed further, that this would lay the foundation for better relations down the road. I have no idea whether Mr. Trump will be reelected or not. I, I don't even dare prognosticate, but I would think that if he does get reelected, don't hope in any real adjustment uh, with China. And I'm afraid his ability, based on past record, stronger relations with our traditional allies, which in my mind should be at the foundation of a new policy. If you want to, quote, contain China, or, or however you want to describe the, the policy, and I agree, this is not the, the Cold War. You know, in the 1960s and 1970s, we had essentially zero trade with Russia, whereas we have hundreds of billions of dollars of moving goods of moving back and forth between China and the United States. So it's a very, very different situation. But I'm afraid I don't see this administration having the foresight to uh, build and, and reconstruct in a, in a more productive way the relations with our traditional allies. And that includes, of course, NATO and the European Union. And, and, you, know, and you know, we have our good friend from Portugal pointing that out. Uh, and, and Japan and Korea uh, to begin with. And then you can add uh, Australia and New Zealand and, and maybe others, Indonesia, India and others. But, that should be the game plan. Uh, I don't see that game plan being operationalized. Maybe somebody at the State Department or the National Security Council, whatever, they're working on it. I don't know, maybe they are, and, and, and that would be great, but I don't see that happening. I don't see the, any manifestation of this at this time. And again, as we are gearing up for what looks to be a very, very ugly and unusual campaign because of, you know, conducted in this environment of no meetings and no rallies and God knows how this is going to come out, but it will be very acrimonious 
and um, Mr. Trump is fighting for dear life because this is it. Uh, and he has every interest in uh, in focusing on enemies that that can that he can rally the troops against. And China, of course, is uh, is uh, is the main one right now. And I don't think that he cares that much about the political fallout or the consequences that this may have. Thank you, Paolo. Before I turn to Bob, I'd like to hear your thoughts. I think maybe the solution is some love letters, like he sent with. Uh, to the leader of North Korea, to President Xi, and then they get together and say they love each other, and then we go off and nothing the happens. <laughs> That's right, and nothing happens. Good point. Bob, what do you say about all this? Bob, please. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, Mr. Trump is pr prone to these love letters with dictators. He, he likes to do this sort of thing, and that undercuts the strategy. Uh, from my view, I, there, there is a, I think in Washington, there is a fairly strong consensus about what needs to be done. Uh, it's written down in the Trump administration strategies. Uh, the Defense Department, it was mentioned how the Defense Department, they, they're planning, uh, and they're planning, uh, and, and they have a strategy uh, for, for Asia, for the world, and for China, and allies are fundamental to that strategy. Uh, the Trump administration's national security strategy is devoted to allies. It's, it's very close. It's, it's very traditional in that sense. Uh, all the Democratic candidates that spoke out on this kind of issue in the campaign, they all said, we need our allies as we deal with China. Every one of them said that. And so, so I think that, that this, this will probably happen. It's just going to be a little messy in my judgment. And, and uh, uh, um, uh, so the, the, the impetus to do this, uh, and, and I think the American people uh, in particular, uh, we really aren't well, don't well understand the situation with China. I think these strategists in Washington do, they have a very clear eyed view of, of, uh, of China, but some of them disagree, of course. Uh, and their, their approach is, uh, and that, that clear eyed view, I think is becoming more prevalent as we as we move forward, so I'm not. I don't think it won't happen. I think the the uh, the approach to allies, the understanding that we're in this together, and that this situation is quite serious. I think uh, the Lewis's uh, comments about China undermining the system uh, uh, that exists, the, and we should return to the liberal order. Uh, China is working to make sure that doesn't happen. That's very important for them. They don't want that return to the new liberal uh, international order. Uh, this is against their interests. It's, it's, and so they're working against it readily. And uh, look what they're doing to the European Union and what it stands for. And, uh, and they're undermining the European Union. They're doing it in a way that's incremental. It's not as overt as the Russians and how they challenge Europe, but they're doing this. And I think that over time, what I've seen is that people like me and others, they just get influenced by the evidence. And as more evidence comes out of how the Chinese are doing these kinds of things, you say, this is a systemic struggle. We're in a situation where they are out to undermine the order that we value and to create an order that enables them to do what they're doing. And what they're doing is against what America wants and what I think Europe wants, the rule of law and, uh, and uh, stability, uh, free markets, all of these sorts of things. The Chinese basically are against that. Uh, and they, they want to exploit it, but they're basically against it. And so this is, this is what we're dealing with. And I think, uh, now I've come to this realization after a lot of work and investigation, it takes time. But I think once you do that, if you're fair-minded, you say, my God, look what's going on here. We have to really do something about this. And I think that I've seen that develop in US allied relationships with Japan, with Australia, uh, and with some, some countries in Europe. The Europeans are still, they're so antagonistic to Trump, and for good reason, that that blocks out this kind of calculus. But I think uh, over the long haul, this is the more important one that they'll have to deal with. And as they see that, I think this will be, it makes me optimistic that we will coalesce, not in a way to be hostile to China. No, I don't think so. Uh, and the Thucydides trap is, is not, I don't think this is a real big problem right now. Because this is a, that means war. And Trump doesn't do war. He does trade war. He doesn't do military war. 
And, uh, and so I'm not too worried about that for the short term. So those are my thoughts on this. Uh, as it, so I'm not completely pessimistic at all uh, because China has a lot of problems too, which we haven't dealt with yet. Uh, and we may not deal with them today, uh, which offset some of these seemingly powerful situations that China uh, has. Thank you very much, Rob. I would say just one point before I turn to Luis, and that is Australia. Uh, the Chinese uh, minister, I think, referred to Australia as the gum on the bottom of your shoe. So I think that a lot of these countries maybe are having an epiphany now. Maybe they knew it all along, but it's kind of we were asleep and now we're waking up and thinking, wait a minute, you mean they did that with the virus? They did this, they did that. So there is a certain, I think, effort now on the part of countries like Australia, Japan, Germany, and others to reduce their dependence on China. And that may be, uh, despite Trump, a, a positive result. Now they passed this resolution now that they're going to do an investigation into the source of the WHO. Now as a lawyer, I would say that is an investigation that has zero chances of ever having any efficacy because you're never gonna get any information or evidence because no one's gonna provide it, so what's the, it's not worth anything. The fact that China agreed to the resolution is a really good thing because it, again, focusing attention on what happened in Wuhan is important, irrespective of whether you can ever prove what happened. So people are waking up to it. They've been in a deep sleep. I would also add on the South China Sea and what, where that's going because that's a dangerous development in Taiwan as well. Anyway, Luis, go ahead, please. I just wanted to say that we've got some parties out there, including Vietnam, our, age, our, our enemy, which is now kind of the enemy, my enemy, is, enemy of my enemy is my friend. We are helping them because China is stepping on top of these small countries in the South China Sea, and the only country the state can help them is the United States. So maybe despite Trump, there are hopes for getting together with our allies to counter China. Luis, please, go ahead, thank you. And let me, I fully agree with both Paolo and Bob. Just let me <clears throat> add something on what Bob said, because the question is that China already possesses significant access to the international system. And on the other hand, it has also made considerable strides in securing leadership positions in important components of the global governance architecture, including the International Telecommunication Union, the UN Industrial Development Organization, International Civil Aviation Administration, Interpol, International Criminal Police Organization, and so on. But uh, my point is that, uh, to be sure, all major powers seek to promote their own vital interests within international organizations. What is unique and ultimately parallels about China's pursuit of its core interests is that its growing activism in the UN and other international institutions is rooted in a number of narrow self-interest political purposes that ultimately shore up its power under a single authority, the Communist Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party. And if we look the way China is advancing its interests and values, also in multilateralism and international institutions, I would say that it's promoting a particular view of human rights in which governments can cite unique local conditions, redefining democracy in terms of so-called economic and social rights rather than civil or political rights, making state sovereignty inviolable and establishing states as the only legitimate stakeholders, infusing consensus, global goals with Chinese ideological terms and foreign policy strategies, such as the Belt and Road Initiative, and resolving political issues through bilateral negotiations, where China can use its full panoply of leverage to get its way, rather than throughout rules-based approaches. Well, these activities transcend China's traditional defensive posture in international organizations, in which it was careful to avoid confrontation with the US and instead direct its diplomatic resources toward boxing in Taiwan and preventing criticism of China. Today, rather than focusing on narrow and self-defined core interests, such as isolating Taiwan or criticism of Chinese policies in Xinjiang or Tibet, for instance, 
Beijing now also seeks to grow its claws by extending its concepts of human rights and sovereignty to other illiberal states. Mm. Through its behavior in international organizations, it's making the world safe for <laughs> autocracy, oh. not, not for uh, liberal values. So what we need is to preserve the multilateral system, the liberal order, recreate confidence between traditional allies, partners, because China is a completely different challenge than Russian Federation or the former Soviet Union. And uh, I think one of the things the US should do is create a concept of democracies to sustain this liberal international order that China is against it. But okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I, do, we do have a couple of questions and um, um, Denise, um, can you just maybe text them to me and maybe I'll, I'll ask them, can, but uh, I mean, the oh, 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 yeah, yeah, but I'm having a problem reading them on my computer. So, um, Paolo, why don't you take the next uh, reaction and then in the meantime, we'll see if we can square up the questions, okay? <clears throat> well, look, uh, yes, I mean, I, I, fully, I, I fully agree with our colleagues here. Uh, we are in a, in, a, in a new situation, I, but we also, I would like to add a little bit of perspective, and I, and I know that there are millions of theories here uh, on the actual strength of China. Um, we, in the West, still rely on Chinese statistics, right? About growth, about unemployment, about this and that. Uh, and uh, however, you know, those who will look uh, deeply into this data are extremely skeptical about Chinese uh, uh, growth uh, and, uh, and believe that uh, it's a, essentially an unsustainable economic model. It's completely debt driven uh, and, and, the, and this trend was accentuated by the Chinese attempts to uh, react or to prevent any adverse reactions from the consequences, I should say, of the 2008 financial crisis. And th therefore, there's a lot less there than we uh, are led to think. Of course, uh, China has every interest in inflating its uh, uh, GDP growth uh, statistics, just to mention the most obvious ones. Well, you say, well, 6%. Some people say it's not 6, it's 3. Well, if it's 3, it's a disaster, okay? Because China cannot afford 3, if it's 3. I don't know if it's 3 or 4 or 4.5. Four I have no idea. But certainly, it's not 6. We know that. And so the question is, as we are sizing you know, our competitor, and I fully agree with Professor Sutter when he said that there is this huge competition about the leading technologies of tomorrow and who owns them probably will have a, a lead that it may be unsurpassable depending on the areas and the sectors. But also let's try to understand better whom we are dealing with. And again, I have nothing particularly original to contribute here, other than uh, you know, relaying the skepticism of so many who say Chinese growth, no, it's not what they say. Chinese unemployment, no, it's not what they say. Um, and uh, the damage caused by coronavirus, of course, they have admitted that they are in a recession, but the assessment by independent observers is, is a lot worse than they're telling us. With that, I'm not saying, oh, China is a paper tiger, is really nothing, and we can just dismiss them. I'm not suggesting that for a moment. But I would say that this uh, um, narrative of this kind of irresistible, unstoppable race to the top, whereby their model proves to be successful time and again, and as they've managed to do for, since the days of Deng Xiaoping in the, you know, in the 80s and on and on and on, and that this is a formula that essentially is unbeatable. Um, I have my doubts about that. We are, you know, of course, we have access to our own information domestically about what, what happens in the United States or in the West in general, and we know all kinds of problems and, and other issues, et cetera, you know, low productivity, whatever. Many, many things that we could discuss on another occasion. But this notion that we are dealing with this unstoppable giant is a, perhaps a bit 
exaggerated. Uh, and I am, and I'm not saying that China will implode in the same way as the Soviet Union did, but it may, it may coast and it may get into, you know, a so-so level of growth that would make the challenge that we believe to be there today probably less um, mountainous, you know, less uh, the, the enormity of it. Say, so, oh my God, there's nothing we can do about it because this bulldozer will take over the world. Maybe not. That's just a thought. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a couple of questions here. Thank you, Paolo. Let me, let me throw that out a little bit. They're terrific. So Eduardo Mendez has an interesting question saying, well, if the damage, you know, we have these issues with the European Union, um, uh, who should the United States ally with uh, besides NATO? Is there some other partner or some other situation where we can get some, as this states, good and trustful partners we used to be together with Europe. The U.S. and Europe were long-standing partners, but that seems to be frayed now. What do you see as an alternative? Anybody want to take that? Luis, you want to handle that one? The U.S. and Europe, it doesn't work. How do we fix it? Portugal, perhaps? Okay. So I think it's, we are living now a strange moment. We are waiting for what is going on in the next elections in the U.S. But I think the US, although there are some democracies in other parts of the world, including Japan, South Korea, allies as well, it's hard to find countries and societies sharing the same values as the US, as the Europeans have. And in Europe, it's impossible to find a great power sharing the same values more or less the same values that we have in Europe, although the, the the US. That's why I'm mentioning the problem with Trump's administration, some positions and politics, because we usually we are in the same side with the US in major, most important issues of the global uh, global affairs, and suddenly we, as NATO, European allies, or the European Union, are side by side with Russia and China in one side and the US on the other side. I gave you several examples. This is difficult to deal for us. We are waiting for the US leadership, uh, including some help from the US. Uh, but the problem with this administration, Trump administration, is that not only the lack of the ability to lead, I think is the lack of will to lead the world, to lead the allies, to lead the international organizations. Um, and this is a major problem because we are living in an, in an international order, mostly created by both European and uh, North American, US and European. Without uh, the leadership of the US, without the strong alliance between Europe and the US, the world will be recreated by others, including many, many in Europe, and not only in Europe, are being afraid that the next international order will be recreated by the US and China, um, putting us aside, us Europeans aside. And the, in that case, the world order will be totally different. Of course, we are also divided in Europe. And now we have UK outside uh, the European Union. This is another problem, both in European re relations between member states of the European Union and NATO European member states, because we have one major European country outside the European Union and inside NATO, which was Turkey. Now we have two major European powers outside the European Union and NATO. So what is going on, good or bad, in transatlantic relations immediately have, um, affects in Europe itself and between European countries. And if US alienate Europe, alienate the European Union, 
alienate NATO member allies uh, gives more room for China's influence or and Russia's influence. And this is another problem for us. So we are waiting a new leadership coming from Washington, DC. Thank you very much, uh, Luis. A question from Sinem Vatanartiran, who is the president of Bay Atlantic University, and is asking a question. Terrific. Question is, what do the experts think about Tsai and uh, second term in Taiwan uh, and the politics around Taiwan? How will this new government have an influence on the tension between China and the United States? You want to take that, Bob? Bob, why don't you take that first, and then Paolo will. will okay, sure, no problem. Um, uh, I think Tsai Ing-wen, uh, the, uh, the context here is that the United States government has improved its relationship a lot with Taiwan. This has been going on um, dramatically. Well, it's been going on uh, over the last couple of years, last two years uh, in particular. It's a very big change in, in, from the point of view of uh, people that watch Taiwan. But it's all been done incrementally, so it's not sensational. And that's just the way that the Tsai government likes it. Uh, they don't want big trouble with China. Uh, and so, but they do want the U.S. to be more supportive, and the U.S. is. And so this is a, a deepening relationship between the United States and, and Taiwan it's, uh, that's going to continue, it seems to me, uh, certainly under a Trump government. And I think it would probably continue under a Democratic administration as well. Uh, so this uh, offsets the pressure that the Tsai government faces with China. Uh, and China is frustrated uh, by the Tsai's government unwillingness to move forward on reunification, steps toward reunification that the mainland wants. And, uh, and so she won't do that uh, because the voters in Taiwan definitely don't want that. And so, uh, so this is the, the impasse that we have. And this, this is going to continue. Uh, the Chinese uh, PRC will apply more pressure on uh, Taiwan. Uh, the U.S. will uh, uh, support Taiwan almost uh, in a way like, uh, like a cha uh, changing the situation back. In effect, uh, China wants to change the status quo in cross-strait relations, and the U.S. is moving to change it back when they do this. And so we have this kind of situation playing out with Taiwan right now. Uh, and I think it can be managed effectively. Uh, I don't think we have to have a, uh, a, 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 a military clash here, but it's always sensitive with Beijing, as we know. This is a very sensitive issue for them. Uh, but Tsai is a very sober leader, and I don't think she wants to do anything that would cause Beijing to attack Taiwan. And so, uh, but she doesn't want to do what Beijing wants uh, from a political point of view. So we'll have an impasse, we'll have tension, the U.S. will continue to improve its relations with Taiwan, uh, and the PRC will continue pressure on Taiwan. I think that's what I foresee in the next year or so. Uh, um, Paolo, very quick, or just a minute, because sure. we'll have to wrap it up. Thank you. I'll sure. Uh, uh, very quickly, again, a news item that I'm sure all of you gentlemen uh, have seen uh, is uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing uh, announcing uh, possibility of a major investment in Arizona. We talk about $12 billion. So is that a game changer? No, but it's part of the incremental changes that I think Professor Sutter was alluding to. In other words, there is clearly an effort to strengthen the uh, relationship at multiple levels between Taiwan and the United States. And clearly Taiwan being uh, uh, a place in which uh, um, you know, many leading edge technologies are being uh, experimented and, uh, and, and fielded is a critical partner of the US high tech industry. And in this uh, ongoing effort, which will be strengthened now in the post coronavirus environment to move out of China based supply chains, uh, strengthening relations with Taiwan in that respect, high tech will be part of it. And this promised, uh, at least this is not still in the discussion phase, but the, this big announcement of a major investment by the Taiwanese on US soil means we, the United States, want to have critical access to critical uh, Taiwanese technology uh, here at home with uh, the agreement, of course, uh, of Taiwan and not make these technologies hostages of, of, you know, of geopolitical changes if uh, uh, and whatnot. So I think that's an indicator 
of the effort to strengthen the bilateral relationship. I think everybody here is aware of the pitfalls. Any, anything even remotely resembling to a, a unilateral declaration of independence by Taiwan could have pretty severe consequences. And the Chinese have expressed this, you know, have established this red line long ago. But I agree with the, you know, with my colleagues that uh, we don't have to go there. And, and uh, but I, I also believe that the United States uh, is cognizant that any uh, additional pressures on Taiwan uh, that would amount to the loss of its uh, de facto sovereignty would be, would be consequential. So I think that everybody is kind of navigating this uh, 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 sort of uh, softly and in a circumspect way, but I, I certainly see in the light of what's happening with Beijing that uh, uh, America wants to strengthen the bilateral relationship with Taiwan. Well, we've reached the end of our webinar and I want to uh, uh, say thank you very much to our panelists, uh, uh, Professor Robert Sutter from George Washington University, uh, Professor Louis Tomei from University of Autonomous University of Lisbon, and of course our very own Paolo von Schirach, who is the president of GPI and the chairman of political science at Bay Atlantic University. And a big shout out again to Denis Karatash, our executive director. I think we covered so many interesting things that we need a few more webinars, right, uh, Paolo, to cover Absolutely. this issue because this, this, these issues are not going to go away. And, um, you know, in my last point is John Lopez's question, which is very interesting. We didn't have time. Right? Will China ever be responsible for COVID-19? I'm a lawyer. I say forget it. I don't think it's, there are some, actually some lawsuits out there right now in the state yes. of Missouri and elsewhere suing not only China because of sovereign, because of foreign sovereign immunity, but suing the Communist Party, which I think someone had mentioned, which is not entitled to sovereign immunity. Those are not going to happen, but still, this is an un, you know, this is a, this is an unending saga. Thank you very, very much for contributing to enlightening us with great discussion through GPI and Bay Atlantic University. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. And uh, we'll say to you, um, as I say in Portuguese, uh, grande abraço, right, Luis? A big hug to everyone. I'm learning very little Portuguese from Luis. <laughs> right. And uh, cumprimentos. And so long to everybody. And uh, thank you very, very much for a wonderful discussion. Have a wonderful day. And stay safe and well. Thank you. Thank you all.